All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. On behalf of the AgriLinks team, I'd like to welcome you to the September AgriLinks webinar titled The Private Sector and Smallholder Adaptation, What We Know. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I will be facilitating the webinar today. AgriLinks webinars are a product of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and are implemented by the Feed the Future Sorry about that, we had a little bit of a, an audio blip there. I think we're, we're doing well. Um, all right, so we are excited to have a great cast of speakers today who will share some key takeaways from the Feed the Future learning community for supply chain resilience with a focus on cost. Uh, but before we get started with the content, I'd just like to provide a few reminders. First, the chat box is your main way to communicate today. So thank you to everyone who has introduced it's always really fun to see that we've got a global audience for these events. Um, and throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat box to network, share links and resources, and ask questions. We'll be holding most of the questions <laughs> until the end of the webinar. Uh, we'll be collecting them in a, a section uh, that only the presenters can see, sorting through them, and preparing to ask them at the end of the webinar. So please do um, put those in the chat box at any time. We're also recording this webinar, and we'll post the recording, the transcript, and any other resources uh, on AgriLinks. And if you're watching the webinar today, you will get an email when that recording is available. OK, I think that's about it. So it's time to dive into the content. We've got a lot to get through today. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it on to our first speaker. To give an introduction to our suite of speakers and to the scope of the webinar, I would like to introduce Kurt Reinsma, who is a Senior Partnership Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. So I'll pass the mic on over to Kurt. Hi, good morning everybody, afternoon, evening, whatever it is in your part of the world. Um, again, I'm Kurt Reinsma. I work in the Bureau for Food Security here at USAID. And just a reminder for those who might not be familiar with uh, all of these uh, various initiatives. Um, the Bureau for Food Security is the lead implementer for the United States government Feed the Future initiative. Uh, and uh, the primary focus of that initiative is to work with smallholder farmers in a significant number of countries around the world and smallholder farming systems, not just the farmers, of course. Increasingly, uh, we have become very much aware that it's not just about working with farmers to increase their production or their incomes, but it's also helping them to address a variety of threats that they're facing to their livelihoods. That includes things like higher temperatures, erratic rainfall, plant diseases, and uh, a number of other factors that the smallholder farmers are facing. We're also increasingly aware that we can't do that alone. We really need to work with uh, private sector, the research community, and align resources to have more impact in trying to address that enormous challenge. So that led us in 2015 to, to launch an initiative to try to really think systematically about new ideas and new approaches to best engage with particularly private companies, including the research community and others, uh, to address these, these uh, weather-related challenges and other challenges to, uh, to smallholder resilience. That, uh, that initiative that we launched in 2015 resulted in three specific activities. Um, one we're calling Climate Smart Cocoa, one we're calling the Alliance for Resilient Coffee, and the main focus today is the learning community for, su for supply chain resilience, which in some ways uh, works across the other two initiatives and rolls it up into a learning agenda. Taken together, these three activities systematically and strategically seek to understand where private companies are at on this issue and how can we better develop the shared value proposition to align public and private resources. So uh, today we've got, uh, we've got a focus on not all of that uh, huge agenda, but a certain component of it. Uh, again, we're, we're focused mainly on the learning community for supply chain resilience. That activity is led by SIAT. Um, I'm never quite sure of the English translations. I think it's the Center for Tropical Agriculture. International Center. 
International Center for Tropical Agriculture, um, the Sustainable Food Lab, uh, IITA, uh, and Root Capital. CIAT focuses on many things, but including the climate impact modeling and mapping, Sustainable Food Lab on the private sector engagement. IITA is doing a lot of on-the-ground work in Uganda and elsewhere with uh, smallholders and companies. And uh, Root Capital focuses on the local private sector, particularly coffee enterprises, as well as the M&E systems. So with that, I will move very quickly to uh, speaker, in, speaker intros. You, uh, you, we don't have time to go through all of this, but I'll just uh, very quickly mention that Mark Lundy is a senior scientist at IITA. Mm -hmm focusing his work on um, market systems and uh, the impact on poverty reduction and how market systems can contribute to climate resilient value chains. Stephanie Daniels uh, is Senior Program Director at the Sustainable Food Lab. She focuses a lot on partnerships in agricultural value chains and resilience in those value chains. We have uh, joining us uh, remotely from Uganda Laurence Jasonji, Jasoni, sorry, uh, Laurence, if I butchered your pronunciation. Um, Laurence, uh, Laurence is a senior agronomist uh, for IITA based in Kampala and working on coffee research issues across IITA's work. And finally, we have Elizabeth Lizzie Teague, uh, who's the environmental performance uh, manager for Root Capital. Let me leave it at that and pass over to Mark. Okay, Kurt, thank you so much for the introduction and welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, first off, a thank you to USAID uh, and the KDAD team for putting together this important speaker. I feel very happy to have the opportunity to share the results of this project with a relatively broad audience and to pulling all this together. So I want to start by giving a quick overview uh, of what the project, the Learning Community Project, seeks to do. So you can hear, see here that there are three specific goals of this project. The first is to engage the global private sector. Uh, the second is to make science actionable. And the third is to build a learning community around these topics. So the first piece is trying to understand how do we have a conversation about uh, weather and uh, temperature and rainfall shifts with the private sector and how do we use that to build partnerships that lead to long-term interventions and, in, and innovations that allow the supply chains we're looking at to become more resilient over time. The second piece is how do we go in science from providing rather scary prognostics uh, in terms of what might happen in the future with certain cropping systems to actually turning those, uh, for, those forecasts into actionable points where the private sector can engage with different actors along the value chain and build effective resilience. And finally, how can we leverage both of these first two points to construct a community that's more effective at learning what of these approaches works where, for whom, why, and under what conditions? Hopefully with the intent being that the lessons learned here can be applied far beyond the initial focus on, on coffee, cocoa, and sorghum and applied to many other cropping systems and value chains globally. So what have we achieved to date? So you can see here some results. I won't go through all of them, but we've had quite a large piece of work on engaging the private sector and having conversations about what, how they look at issues around uh, adaptation for smallholders. And uh, you can see there's, a, there's quite a bit of work focused in Ghana and West Africa and Uganda, uh, Ghana principally on cocoa and Uganda on coffee and on sorghum. We've also gone through a series of processes around the science end of things as uh, both SEAT and IITA form part of the uh, climate change agriculture and food security global initiative led by the CGIAR research centers. We've gone through and tried to take the climate projections and make them as actionable as possible, identify specific climate smart practices that seem to be the most uh, relevant, and then also conduct cost-benefit analysis develop what we call stepwise investment uh, pathways, which, which Laurence will explain more uh, later on, identify enterprise level assessment tools to see how different members of the value chain can participate in these process, and then build an, an M&E toolkit uh, to assess within value chains the level of climate uh, resilience that's been achieved. 
And then finally, on the learning community, we've been uh, having a series of webinars. This is the first one held within the uh, AgriLinks network, but we've also done several with, uh, with the um, Council on Smallholder Agricultural Finance and also on I with ICEAL and also with the World Cocoa Foundation and others. We've been engaged quite broadly with USAID and with key international platforms. I don't, won't go through them all. So that's more or less where we are. So the next question, so, so what have we, what's our approach and how have we been, been working? So basically we have a very simple high level approach uh, to try to make sense of and try to transition from long term projections of shifts in, in temperature and rainfall patterns and climate uh, to action plans. So these are the four steps we go through and I'll run through these briefly. Uh, first, how exposed is your cropping system and geography? And this is where we identify, for example, the impact gradient of climate on a specific cropping system and geography. The example you see here is from Ghana and it's about cocoa. And what we try to do is identify using very simplistic color schematics, sort of a, a stoplight approach of uh, green, yellow, and red, areas that can cope, which are the green zones. These are areas where you do not expect major impact from shifts in temperature and rainfall to affect the productive or productivity of the system. Yellow areas where you do expect a change in the weather, weather uh, conditions, particularly temperature and rainfall patterns that will require adaptation uh, or adjustment to these new, these new conditions. And then red areas where uh, the, what we're seeing in the future seems to indicate a need to transform or transition out of the key cropping system into other opportunities. So again, green is coping, yellow is adjustment, and red is transform. So once we understand the, the, climate, or the climate projections out to about 2050, we then try to bring together the actors. Because to this point, we've done most of the mapping and, and it gets attention, but it doesn't really lead to action. So the second step is how do we then ground truth or make sense of these, uh, of these different projections with the value chain actors themselves? Again, bringing together multi-stakeholder groups to discuss what exactly is happening, are the projections uh, correct, what additional information can be built in, uh, and how can we begin to uh, enter into a dialogue about what we can do. So that moves us to step three, which is understanding particularly for each of these different levels of projected change in temperature and rainfall, what exactly can we do? What are the relevant agricultural or climate smart agricultural practices by each of these different exposure gradients? Uh, who can implement them? How much do they cost? And what are the expected benefits? The outcome of step three then is a prior prioritized menu of the options with a cost benefit analysis. And that leads us then to step four, which is building specifically uh, tailored investment plans for different kinds of investors that will be, who will be able to then provide funding to support these adaptation strategies. So this is again a very generic framework that we've developed trying to go from sharing projections of what we anticipate to happen out to about 2050 using our best knowledge of projected shifts in rainfall and temperature patterns, bringing together the actors to make sense of what they're seeing identifying specific practices and putting a, a value, an economic value on the costs and benefits of those practices, of implementing those practices, and then rolling those practices up into specific investment strategies for public sector, public and private, and private sector. So there are two other imp important points here just to, to, to complement. And what we're testing, and you'll hear throughout the rest of the presentation, are different entry points. So in some cases, we may be engaging with a specific company on their supply chain. So if you have a specific supply chain, how does that supply chain lay out across these impact gradients in terms of weather shifts in rainfall and temperature? How at risk are different areas of that uh, supply chain to, the, uh, to these changes? And what, do you, what kind of investments or activities need to be implemented in different parts of the chain to make it, great, make it more resilient to these projected changes? A second entry point is bringing together multiple companies sourcing, for example, coffee out of uh, Uganda or sourcing cocoa out of Ghana or sourcing coffee or cocoa out of Honduras to have the same conversation but as a, as a collective group. So how can we take this idea of adapting with smallholder producers and make it a pre-competitive space? 
How can we have conversations that allow people to make these investments in ways that uh, can be done in a collective fashion that is perhaps more efficient than each individual company doing, doing it on their own? And then the third aspect we've been piloting is this idea of looking at landscapes as the entry point and saying if you have multiple crops coming off of a landscape that, that will have different levels of, uh, of, uh, of effects from changes in, in rainfall and temperature patterns, how can we build collective action around that even though the crops may be somewhat different? And then on the right-hand level of the side of the slide, we also identify clearly that there are different roles uh, for, financial, uh, for, the, for the finances behind this. In the areas where you have uh, coping strategies where impacts from the changes in temperature and rainfall will be relatively low, we would expect the private sector to be able to lead on those investments simply because the return on investments made there will result in uh, coffee or cocoa or sorghum or any other crop being produced that can then be uh, purchased by the private sector. And so that's their core business and so should be led, these, the investments there should be led by the private sector. In areas where you need to adjust, uh, where, the, where the, the shifts in the rainfall patterns and the temperatures will be greater, uh, but the crop will remain, re remain viable, then we're talking mostly about public-private kinds of engagement. An example of this would be the development of new coffee varietals being led by uh, World Coffee Research, which, uh, which seek to adapt to two, to, two to two degrees more temperature. Uh, and this is a, a long-term, relatively complex endeavor that re requires blending both public funding and private funding to, to, to make sense of and, and make work. And then in the transformation zones where we're talking about people moving out of the cropping system we're looking at, there we see it very much as a public goods discussion where we would expect the public sector to take a lead simply to have a managed transition from, for example, a cocoa system to other kinds of systems in northern Ghana, but not leaving out the private sector entirely. The role of the private sector here is to come in and develop uh, supply chains or value chains and off-taking strategies for the new crops that will adapt well to the projected changes in climate and temperature. So perhaps led by the public sector and, si and a significant uh, case for public investment, but also, uh, but also a role for the private sector in terms of coming in and building those, those supply chains for, for new crops. So in northern Ghana, you're shifting from cocoa, who comes in and buys cashew? who comes in and buys sorghum, who comes in and buys uh, shea. And so it's, it's making that transition and, and in conversations with the, the, the private actors themselves. So I'm going to hand over now to Stephanie, who's going to talk a little bit about the conversations we've had with the private sector in more detail. Great. Thank you, Mark. Hold on. Yeah. Is, there you go. Okay. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I want to just make the, the point here that the private sector is not monolithic. We have here a simplistic uh, representation of the value chain, and of course, different kinds of companies play different roles. Um, farmers themselves are part of the private sector. They are small business people, um, but also include input providers and retailers. Our focus in the learning community has started on those companies responsible for buying directly from farmers or producer associations and global food and beverage brands and manufacturers that might partner with USAID and others. We consulted with a range of different kinds of companies um, to understand how they're already tackling risk to their supply chains and how the diagnostics in this initiative could help to deepen and scale their investment um, in smallholder adaptation to these risks. So I just want to share uh, the categories we've developed uh, in our interviews with companies, it was noted that in many cases, the trends for investment and adaptation were less associated with their position in the value train as a, as a trader or a roaster and more relevant to the role the company plays. And so we're using the categories of direct service provider, collaborators, and catalyst. The first group is typically both buying from and delivering services to smallholder farmers. Um, an example of this might be Ecom Agritrade, who's a global trading house for coffee and cocoa. A number of years ago, this company established an in-house technical assistance agency called Sustainable Management Services to focus on this role as a service provider, and they're trialing a number of different ways to help farmers adapt to weather variability, drought, pest and disease, et cetera. Collaborating companies tend to work through implementing NGOs or direct suppliers on farmer programs. And depending on their involvement or degree of ownership over these programs, they range in their depth of knowledge and need for climate information. Keurig Green Mountain might be a good example of this kind of company with their supply chain programs to support farmers in key origins. Catalysts are 
those that are sparking action at the sector, sector level, they're looking at the bigger picture, even outside their own value chain. They may provide funding for research, may be visible leaders, and while interested in risk at origin, are rarely implementing programs on the ground. A global company like Nestle is an example of this, who are investing heavily in bolstering scientific information on and satellite imagery and modeling of, of various crops for dairy, coffee, cocoa, et cetera. Um, typically, brands often play both collaborating and catalytic roles. So uh, we've interviewed quite a few different kinds of companies, and this slide gives you a little bit of the data from that, um, from that work. The overwhelming response from the majority of companies is that they are actively responding to and interested in facing the risks that increased drought, heat, heavier rains are bringing to their supply chains and consider the ability of those supply chains to adapt a critical business issue. So most companies have typical supply risk assessment and mitigation plans in place, and climate and weather variability is increasingly integrated into these processes. So you can see here most of the companies interviewed, certainly those in the coffee and cocoa sector who, defend, who depend on smallholder farmers, are focusing programs at the farm level and ag extension, by far, is the, uh, the most common type of program to build adoption of good agricultural practices. Service providers express a higher degree of and have seem to have taken on more responsibility for helping farmers adapt. Catalytic companies like a Mars or a Starbucks are investing in a number of these areas, but certainly support sector-wide sector initiatives on research, whether it be uh, the research on physiological adaptation to heat and drought of cocoa, or as Mark mentioned, the World Coffee Research Trials. So I just want to run through some of the results from companies in terms of what kind of climate and risk information do they need to increase their direct investment at origin through partnership or directly. So across the board, they were interested in translation of agricultural science um, into uh, volumes and quality, the economic impact on supply. Mark's going to talk a little bit about that uh, a bit later. They want to see uh, banks of reliable information in a central place and um, suitability maps that are downscaled to their regions. You can see on the left side, uh, catalytic companies are looking for information that they can take into global strategy, whereas on the right side, as you get closer to the farm, these companies are emphasizing the need for specific weather and, and climate impact data, which, which sometimes is very difficult to get, and practical solutions that delivers value for farmers, as well as better information on the ways that farmers adopt new practices, which is a systemic barrier mentioned by many of the companies we talked to. So what have we learned about how companies make decisions about investments? Two drivers have emerged supply and reputation. Supply concerns, will we be able to source from this region at the quality and quantity we need into the future? And reputation, environmental impact is increasingly important, as we know, for clients, for consumers, shareholders, and many companies value having a reputation as a good corporate citizen. And um, for, for branded companies, reputational risk can have real effects on the bottom line. So. Just a bit more information on the priorities that we've heard uh, for investments. And why does this matter for USAID partnerships? It's really about knowing the priorities of different kinds of potential partners so that we can design strategic initiatives. Really, like Kurt talked about, identify synergies for where the public sector can lead, and for us in the learning community to develop diagnostic tools that can help to unlock more investment. So in general, the risk to stable supply was cited more often by companies as a priority and driver. Catalysts, the leading well-known brands, are looking to tackle sector-wide challenges or those issues aligned with their values. Um, Hershey might be an example where they have a long history of supporting access to education. So their farmer programs tend to have access to information components, and they're interested in ways to quickly scale a digital portal for the knowledge being generation, generated on climate adaptation for directly for farmers. Direct service providers, on the other hand, are more often driven by client and producer needs. Uh, they're on the front lines of dealing with issues like co cocoa swollen shoot disease or coffee leaf rust, um, or market changes like the transition to sustainability certification. So they tend to invest in programs that address those critical issues. 
because I just don't know. And I just want to say a few words that as we shape the pilots in the learning community linked to Climate Smart Cocoa and the Alliance for Resilient Coffee, understanding that making the internal business case for origin investments can be a significant challenge for, uh, for company champions. A part of this is, is to understand the metrics of success for different parts of the company and the incentives. Uh, it's not a task, obviously, or a responsibility that the public sector or USAID needs to take on, but it is helpful to know which part of the business you're talking to and what they might need in terms of data or information to sell an ambitious idea or partnership internally. So I'm just going to close with a few of the key takeaways. Um, the private sector is acting. They are engaged in helping small farmers adapt to a volatile world, but they can't do it alone. Um, and they will not fill the, the space of government action, good policy, and public sector. So they, they're, they're calling for better and smarter collaboration um, to reach vulnerable farmers and to adequately finance higher risk efforts like perennial renovation or retraining farmers in transition zones. Profitability is central. So this is true for farmers, of course. If they can't cover the cost of production, if they can't cover the cost to adapt to climate change, they're going to move to stop farming, as we all know, very difficult situations. So profitability at the farm level and across the value chain is central for good design. So research is needed, but there's an emphasis that we need to have tangible and practical solutions um, and Absolutely. put that into formats that businesses can operationalize quickly. Uh, I think you'll all be familiar with the just over um, abundance of information and data so too much information, uh, we need more accessible and digestible data that we can look to quickly. There were a number of comments, particularly from direct service providers, that longer term commitments are needed, whether that be value chain commitments to a region or uh, donor relationships, um, you know, who are either trying to get new supply chains set up or adapt new supply chains that, that takes many years to build trust, to help farmers adapt to longer term investments. I'll stop there and uh, hand it to Mark to give us some sense of what's happening in the region. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. That was very helpful. So I'm going to move and discuss the, the case of what we're doing, particularly in Ghana, as one example of how, the, how we're trying to transition from the overall exposure mapping down to investment strategies with specific companies in a specific crop uh, landscape. So the Ghana, Ghanaian cocoa sector is quite interesting. I'm not going to provide a, a, a tremendous overview of the sector today, but I just want to say that when we've engaged with the Ghanaian uh, cocoa sector, both the private value chain actors, including farmers, all the way through to uh, buyers and exporters and branded companies, as well as with the enabling environment with the policymakers and uh, Cocoa Bot and other members of the, of the Ghanaian cocoa sector, there have been some key takeaways that we've found thus far. You know, first again, as Stephanie mentioned, the, the, the focus has been principally on short-term thinking. So the concern from most of the actors, particularly those from the private uh, or the commercial end of things, is how can we achieve gains in the short term? They're clearly interested in productivity. They're clearly interested in, in aligning whatever practices can help adapt with uh, short-term gains in terms of increased uh, product yields and, uh, and quality. Uh, there's interest in the, the exposure mapping or the, sustain, or the suitability maps, but then a lot of questions emerge of how this relates to their current practices of promoting good agricultural investments and strategies. Exactly what's new, what's different, what's the same, and how can we align these often significant investments that are ongoing in the promotion of good agricultural practices with uh, longer term shifts in temperature and rainfall and how we can align uh, gains in the short term where they're dealing with weather, uh, short term weather variability with alignment to these longer term shifts in rainfall and temperature patterns. And so that's a big, a big issue. Um, surprisingly, despite the presence of a large number of actors in Ghana, there are relatively small differences between the different approaches that most of these private sector actors are taking towards uh, promoting the uptake of good agric agricultural practices or having conversations around adaptation in the long term. Many of them tend to follow a very similar model where you identify the problem, you develop training materials, you go out and do farmer training, and there is some variation about how farmer training is provided. Uh, you may provide uh, some additional incentives, um, although in Ghana it's less common because you have public sector incentives as well around in input provision. Uh, 
uh, and then you sort of rinse and repeat. So I think that's an interesting thing is, again, not a lot of variation, but again, the common, the common response when we engage with the actors around this question is they feel that the level of effectiveness of actually driving the uptake of these practices is relatively low. So potentially a need to innovate collectively about how to become more effective in actually getting uh, adoption of these practices. And then finally, a clear need for policy dialogue uh, in the case of Ghana. So I want, to look, I want to look a little bit more at the case of policy dialogue before I get into the, the actual engagement with the, the, the private actors in Ghana, because I think it's also uh, relevant for other countries. So when we looked at these maps uh, in Ghana, uh, the private sector was very interested, and they said, but we also need to discuss with, the, uh, with Cocoa Bot, and we need to discuss with other members of the Ghanaian public sector about how these, the, the, what are the implications of this for, for the overall economy of Ghana and the number of farmers that will be affected. So CIA went ahead and did some additional work that we call the cost of inaction, basically trying to project what will happen if no action is taken vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis the shifts in temperature and weather that we're foreseeing. And here's some results from that. So if you begin to look at the number of households that will be impacted by the changes in temperature and rainfall patterns that are projected, you can see that it's about 640,000 households that will be impacted in a negative fashion and about 24,000 households that are located in geographies where the conditions might actually become better for producing cocoa. So a significant downside impact and 640,000 households uh, is a large percentage of the population and clearly if you are a, a politician in Ghana, that's a big number that you might want to pay attention to uh, going forward. And then we also tried to put this information into economic terms. So what does this actually mean in terms of income, uh, and what does it mean in terms of GDP for the country? So this is the second one. So the mean estimate, uh, again, looking at the changes that are projected in rainfall and temperature and the potential impacts of that on cocoa production lead us to believe that the, the impacts could be worth, uh, the, mean, the mean estimate is $470 million a year of lost uh, income for the country based on the effects of changing temperature and rainfall patterns. That's 33% 30, of the export value of cocoa coming out of Ghana currently, or 1.1% of GDP. Uh, and then if we expand the, from the mean to look at the 90% the probability range, you can see that there's a variation from a low of $230 million to a high of $740 million yearly, anywhere between 17 to 54% of export value and anywhere between 0.5 to 1.8 percent of GDP. And the takeaway that I think is very important is that, the, that, it's relative, that in terms of probability, it's, high, it's more probable that you will have the high cost rather than the low cost scenario. So again, what we're trying to do with the public sector engagement here is to spur action by saying there is a cost to inaction. If you do not begin to work on this process and do not begin to make investments and do not begin to collaborate, effectively you're looking at a major impact on the, uh, both in terms of farm, household, farm, household, households that affected, 640,000, as well as income for the country. So based on that, we've been then moving forward, uh, sort of teeing up using those data, the, the public sector support to begin to work more with the, the private sector actors. And we've identified a series of proposed learning sites in Ghana. This work is being conducted in collaboration with the Climate Smart Cocoa project that Kurt mentioned at the out outset, led by the World Cocoa Foundation. So here we're engaging very, very, direct, very directly with them on this process. And we're working, again, with different kinds of, of companies, some of whom are catalysts, some, are who, some of whom are, are collaborators, and some of whom are direct service providers, to begin to identify sites in Ghana where we can actually go and develop specific strategies that will work depending on whether or not you're in a coping site, an adaptive change site, or a transformative site. And interestingly here, um, what we're finding are some, are some different approaches. So companies that are active in the coping and the, adapt and the adaptation sites are principally interested in the questions of how do we get, how do we improve our extension and our service provision models to effectively drive adaptation of the practices that we're identifying. We've been doing extension, we've been doing training, and the level of adoption of those practices remains uniformly low. What can we do differently to increase that and therefore build greater resilience into these cropping systems? And in the transform zone, which is in the northern part of Ghana, uh, interestingly enough, the conversations have been somewhat different. 
There, the role of the companies, uh, rather than just saying we're not going to purchase cocoa from here in the future, was actually proposing that we could, re if, if we could explore the potential of repurposing existing cocoa supply chains and cocoa networks, uh, which they have established and running, to then build in additional crops. So how can we begin to work between a branded company uh, like a Hershey's and, and the trader that they work with to begin to identify what additional crops might fit into these geographies and how we can leverage the existing social organization or commercial networks that are in place to make that transition as, uh, as managed as possible for farmers. So to reduce the risk and to provide them clear opportunities to begin to transition from cocoa, not overnight, but as a, as a stepwise process, moving from one crop to another. So that's more or less where, where we are in Ghana uh, in the process of finalizing these pilot sites, and we'll be providing more information on those in the future. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to Laurence, who's going to talk to us a little bit about Uganda and coffee, we hope. Thank you very much, Mark. I just want to check, can you hear me? OK, I, so I think you can hear me. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit more um, our engagement in Uganda with public and private sector. So one of our first results um, was the maps that you can see here um, in the presentation. Uh, they're the same types of maps as the one Mark was presenting for Coco in Ghana. This is for Arabica in Uganda and it shows the current suitability uh, for Arabica coffee in Uganda in the high left corner. And then you see how suitability changes in 2030 um, in the upper right corner and then 2050 in the down left corner. And what's important here to see is just that green means suitable. And so it actually coincides here in Uganda. It coincides with the um, uh, highlands uh, of Uganda. And what you see when you move to 2030 and 2050, you see that the green uh, diminishes and that you're getting more red, which, mean that's, which means actually that the maps show that suitability is going to decline uh, for Arabica and Uganda. And what we also see is that the suitability moves up the slope. So you have to get higher on the mountains to actually um, have a suit suitable um, agroecology for uh, Arabica coffee. And so when we started actually to engage with the coffee sector in Uganda, we started using these maps uh, because we thought it was a great result and it was very interesting. And so um, we showed them to the public sector and the private sector. But what we realized was that there was a lot of interest, but not more than that. So we had ideas about how they can, could be used for planning, for implementation in the different sites. But what we saw is that it was not really more than just interest and that they never got used um, in, you know, for, for such an objective. And what we saw, and that is also uh, the same as what uh, Mark was explaining for Ghana, we saw that the priority is much more on short-term productivity increases. What we see for partners working closely with farmers, we see that short-term interest is very, um, is very important. And even, you know, long-term sustainability as well, but you also need to have short-term benefits. And short-term benefits are needed for farmers, but also for the company. And so when we saw that the suitability maps were not necessarily doing what we wanted them to do, we started interviewing and talking to mostly private sector again. And what we started talking with them about was this, uh, challenges uh, in short-term productivity increases. And what, what we realized was that the challenge was not necessarily the technology. People know how to grow coffee. But the problem was that farmers were not adopting technologies. And to give you an example, we did a little study with uh, Yara. Yara is a fertilizer company. And they asked us the same question in a site uh, of interest, where they say, well, farmers are not adopting our fertilizer. You know, what, what can we do? And so we did a little study. And the conclusion was actually uh, very simple. Farmers. Um, are often trained by private sector on best practice. So that means like you have, to do, you have to do this and this and this and you prune your coffee and you put fertilizer and you do all of this and you also buy your product and if you do all of this then you get a, a higher yield and because you get a higher yield you get a higher income and you become less poor. But what we saw in the study is that farmers cannot afford best practice. More than 50% of the farmers they were training 
could not afford the package they were trained on. And so now I hope I can change to the next slide. I can. So, um, so then we developed a program uh, based on that input that we got from private sector partners. We uh, developed a program that we call Stepwise, and it's the, the left uh, logo that you see on the, on the slide. And Stepwise, what Stepwise really tries to do is to detangle the whole extension package of best practice in smaller packages of practices that farmers are more, more likely to adopt because they're more affordable. So it's really dividing that best practice into smaller affordable packages of practices. It's really an extension tool and it appeals a lot to the private sector um, whom we work with on the ground. And so what you see in the middle, you see a map of Uganda and what you see there is four circles. So in this program, what we started doing, we started to work with private sector and partners in those um, learning sites. So, and what we're doing is we're testing the stepwise approach in those learning sites. So in the center circle, for example, it's a Robusta learning site, and it's a learning site where we engage with the Hans Neumann Stiftung, and that is through a sister project that is called the Alliance Resilience for Coffee. Uh, sorry, the Alliance for Resilient Coffee. Then in South, you have another thick circle. That's another of those sites uh, with the sister project. And that is together with the Ancole Coffee Producers Cooperative Union. And then we have in the East, another thick circle. That is a learning site, an Arabica learning site. And there we are engaging with Olam. And then you have a thin circle in the West. And that is a learning set, like we're just starting conversations there, and that is with Great Lakes Coffee, who's very interesting, interested in our extension approaches as well. So what's interesting, you know, I'm naming all these uh, different private sector partners because what's interesting is that they all have another, another typology, if I, I may say. Olam is a multinational, Great Lakes Coffee is based in Uganda and, and Congo, for example, like, or sorry, sourcing from Uganda and, and uh, Congo, for example. Um, you have Ancoli coffee producers. They're a union, you know, so they are an umbrella of cooperatives. And the Hans Neumann Stiftung is really um, linking us with the sister, um, the sister project on Alliance for Resilient Coffee. So that's why we selected those, um, those partners as well. And so now I'm going to dive into the, just to give you examples of learning. So I'm going to dive into the, um, the learning site of Olam in the east, the Arabica site. And what we see, it's called the Sironko learning site in, in Mount Elgin in the east of Uganda. And what we see in our engagement is that the current needs to help the farmers, we need simple uniform messages. So that's what we're trying to do in the stepwise program. We need specific practices to address specific problems. Um, you know, we also need to address currently observed climate change impacts. We need to move away from best practice to affordable practice. So that's what we're trying to do with Stepwise when it comes to farmers. Now, when we engage through Stepwise with the private sector actors, what we see is that there always needs to be a business case. It's not only about the farmers, it also, it's also about business. Um, what uh, Olam is very interested in is the link from extension with monitoring. So we give information and we give recommendations to farmers, but how can we at the same time get information back from farmers? And by getting that information back from farmers, maybe we can refine the recommendations that we give to them. And then we need to focus more on the short term but still need to keep awareness raising about the long-term implications of climate change without scaremongering. Um, now, this is the learning in the site uh, of Olam. Now, back to you, Mark. Thank you, Laurent. Oh, sorry, Thank busy, you, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, thanks, Laurent. Yes. <laughs> thanks, Laurent. Good to hear your voice. Um, so, hello everyone. My name is Elizabeth Teague and I work with Root Capital, a business lender and trainer working in smallholder agricultural value chains. So far today, we've largely spoken about working with global private sector actors like international traders, Olam for example, who Laurence just discussed, to support adaptation through direct engagement with farmers. I'm going to add another layer to the discussion. 
supporting farmer adaption through local private sector players, specifically local farmer enterprises. By farmer enterprises, in this discussion, we mean agricultural businesses that are embedded in local communities and sourced from and serve smallholder farmers. This could include businesses like farmer cooperatives or small local traders or processors that are on the front lines with farmers. Farmer enterprises have enormous potential to help drive smallholder adaptation. This is because these enterprises can provide farmers with the information and resources needed to prepare for short-term weather variability and longer-term changes. In some supply chains and geographies, local farmer enterprises are the primary or only source of technical assistance and credit for smallholders, or they serve as important linchpins between farmers and upstream global actors. In most cases, as with global companies, as Mark and Laurence were discussing, local enterprise services currently focus on short-term objectives, namely productivity or quality improvements. But the service platform is there, and the ongoing relationship with farmers is there. There's enormous potential to work with farmer enterprises to tweak their services to focus more on adaptation. So recognizing this potential, the learning community and its partner initiatives seek to work with local private sector actors alongside the global actors we've been discussing today. Primarily, we seek to help global companies incorporate local farmer enterprises in their supply chains into their adaptation planning. Again, here we're, we're really focusing on providing companies with blueprints and tools to move from the science to actual action with local partners. So, through the learning community, we're doing a few things. First, we're piloting all the adaptation tools Mark and Laurence have discussed, the climate risk maps, the adaptation practice menus, et cetera, directly with local farmer enterprises to understand their needs and how these needs align or differ from those of global companies. For example, we have four learning sites with coffee cooperatives in Honduras and Uganda, including the one just mentioned by Laurence, under the Alliance for Res um, Resilient Coffee Initiative. In these sites, we will learn what cooperatives are already doing to support farmer adaptation through extension and credit services, what gaps remain, and how supply chain partners and allies might support cooperatives in introducing a more targeted adaptation approach to their services. A really important part of these learning sites is understanding the cost of enterprise adaptation services in different supply chains and geographies. Farmer enterprises may require additional resources to tweak or expand their services. By outlining the cost of specific adaptation activities, farmer enterprises can seek investment from supply chain partners interested in the same adaptation objectives, whether this investment comes in the form of technical assistance, credit, grants, price premiums, or long-term purchase agreements with buyers. As these four learning sites run in parallel to our sites with global companies like Olam, we'll be able to directly compare the opportunities and constraints of engagement at these different stages in the supply chain and share this learning with private sector partners. Second, informed by our experience in these learning sites, we'll be developing a diagnostic that evaluates the capacity of local farmer enterprises to manage these types of targeted adaptation services. This diagnostic will be designed for global companies and other supply chain partners, like financial institutions, like group capital, or capacity builders, um, as part of the larger toolkit um, that Mark introduced earlier. So the idea is that these companies or financial institutions, et cetera, will be able to self-diagnose the capacity of local farmer enterprises within their own supply chains to support adaptation. This diagnostic is in development, so please stay tuned for details over the coming year. So to summarize before I hand it off to Mark to close, given the scale and complexity of the adaptation challenge, we see a need to engage all along the supply chain, from the global catalyst or collaborator level that Stephanie discussed, to the global direct service provider, to the local farmer enterprise. By taking a supply chain approach, we see an opportunity to leverage complementary areas of expertise and influence. Certainly local farmer enterprises won't always be part of the picture, depending on the supply chain, but in supply chains where farmer co-ops or local traders are prevalent, they can serve as a really powerful platform to build farmer adaptation at scale. And with that, I'll hand it back to Mark. Thank you, Lizzie. Uh, so, so just some concluding thoughts before we open for questions, and I see there are quite a few coming in. I want to thank everyone for participating. There are some very good questions in the chat that we look forward to digging into in just a moment. 
some, some quick conclusion, concluding takeaways from what we've seen thus far uh, in this project. The first point I think is uh, clear, but it's worth restating. The corporate partners that we've been engaging with in this process are interested, are making, are doing things, are investing at, at origin, and they're interested in this topic. So I think there is uh, a clear business case to be made for engaging and working with the private sector on topics related to adaptation with smallholder farmers, particularly in crops where you have a significant smallholder farming base. But the second point that's also important, and I think Stephanie alluded to it very, very clearly in her presentation, is that the private sector is not monolithic. The private sector, I mean, we're, we're very quick and good about talking about social differentiation among farmers and gender differentiation among farmers and households and lots of other ways of nuancing how farming households are distinct. But the same holds true for the private sector. When you're going to be engaging with the private sector around smallholder adaptation, you need to be very clear about what kind of company you're engaging with, what's their role in the value chain, how are they going to approach adaptation, and how can you effectively work with them or perhaps work with multiple private sector companies in the same value chain or in connected value chains to, lead, to promote effective adaptation. Thirdly, um, corporate partners, again, while interested and while willing to make investments and engage directly with farmers, are unable to uh, replace needed public investments. And I think that's an important piece to keep in mind. Uh, the private sector can get things quite a ways down the road, but they can't necessarily get across the finish line on their own. So this becomes a question of how do we identify the most relevant leverage points where targeted uh, public sector or public goods investment can effectively catalyze the role that the private sector can play. And here we're talking not so much about subsidizing private sector companies, but rather incentivizing practices that are more inclusive and reach, for example, more vulnerable smallholders where, for, for, where the business case may be more difficult to make. So how do we leverage our funding intelligently to achieve development goals uh, while working around uh, or working with private partners? Uh, fourth, it's very important uh, to connect these long-term climate or weather and temperature shifts, wet rainfall and temperature shifts, with short-term productivity gains. I think from a research perspective, certainly speaking uh, from, from working at, at CAT and with the broader uh, CCAS network on these topics, one of the things that we need to get better at is making the connection between long-term uh, projections in terms of what's going to happen with rainfall and temperature with short-term weather variability. And this is something that there, there's been some good advance, uh, again, under the CCAF's umbrella, working with Columbia University, for example, in Rwanda and elsewhere, making these connections. But it's something that we need to do more systematically. How do we actually align practices that, that deliver value in the short term vis-a-vis -vis weather variation or weather variability, but also build resilience in the long term in farming systems to projected rainfall and temperature shifts? And finally, uh, adaptation is not only about farm level practices. This is something I think that, that, again, bears repeating. We think about adaptation to, to weather shift, to, to climate and temperature, or to temperature and rainfall shifts, and we think about it at the farm scale. Clearly, that's necessary. But there's also an entire separate piece about changes in incentives and business models and buying practices from the private sector that needs to align in order to effectively incentivize and sustain the investments that need to be made at the farm level. You can't just identify practices and assume that farmers are able to make investments to build resilience, as Laurence explained very clearly with the stepwise, stepwise approach. You actually need to build practices into the value chain that provide financial flows, information flows, and clearly incentives and support for those practices to actually be adopted at scale and not just remain in, in very nice extension manuals, but actually to be, to be used. And this is an area that I think uh, requires more work uh, certainly something that we'll be doing in the learning community, but it's something that we feel requires a bit more thought. So finally, uh, what are the next steps for this particular uh, project of private sector engagement? Well, we're continuing uh, the three lines of work that we laid out at the beginning. In terms of engaging the private sector, we will be finalizing and documenting the results from the pilots we discussed in West Africa and in East Africa. We didn't mention the sorghum case, but there is an additional sorghum case. We'll be designing pilots in Central America in collaboration both with the Climate Smart Cocoa Program led by the World Cocoa Foundation and with the Alliance for Resilient Coffee led by the Hans Neumann Foundation. Uh, 
Uh, and we're beginning, to, we're beginning to explore the last point I mentioned on the previous slide. In addition to practices, how do we align process? And I would say it's process with the, the private actors, but also in engagement with more of the enabling environment public sector. How do we begin to get everyone pulling in the same direction and getting the incentives lined up? Uh, on the issue of making science, science actionable, we're now moving from sort of the, the generation of knowledge, which I think has been a, a major focus of the first part of this project, to actually turning this into specific recommendations and specific investment plans for geographies, cropping systems, uh, and different partners. And again, the key issue here is how do we better align the long-term shifts in temperature uh, and rainfall patterns with the short-term variability in climate to develop solutions that both respond to short-term needs as well as long-term resilience. And as far as, as a learning community, and this is where we would certainly be very willing and interested in engaging with, with those of you who are interested, we'll be continuing to do webinars. Uh, there'll be a learning journey with uh, key private sector actors. And we'll be convening uh, probably towards the end of 2018. I'm looking at Kurt if that's the right date. Yes? OK. Uh, a global conference on this topic uh, to begin to actually have a, a more you know, face to face and open discussion about what are we actually learning. And we would welcome, of course, input and ideas and experiences from all of you. Uh, certainly, you have many experiences uh, from, where, from the work you're doing, and we would love to, to include you as we begin to build towards that, that conference. And we'll also be building out a, a centralized website uh, that will allow this information to be shared and available to, to all of you more broadly. So with that, I'd just like to, to say thank you to everybody who's been on the webinar, and we'll hand over to Julie, who I believe will be facilitating the questions and answer session. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mark. And thanks to everyone who has posted some really great questions in the chat box. We will try to get to as many as we can in the next uh, half hour or so. Uh, if we're not able to get all, to all of your questions, we will definitely be sharing them with the presenters after the fact, and we'll see what we can do uh, to get them answered via AgriLinks. Uh, and also, just for those of you, I see a few people had asked if you can download the presentation. Uh, it is now available on the left side of your screen in the little file downloads box there. Uh, so please do go ahead and download the PowerPoint. All right, we've had a bunch of questions come in, and I'll run down a few for our presenters. Uh, first up were a couple of questions from Albert Marty. And his first question, uh, he commented that the model that you shared is very interesting, Mark. But what have been the challenges of working with the public sector with respect to the model? And has the model been able to help private organizations deal with these identified risks effectively? Thanks, Albert. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, again, I think what we I, I tried to get at this a bit with the, the discussion of the cost of inaction in Ghana. So what, we were, what, we, what I think is necessary when we talk about working with both the public sector and the private sector is to understand that the demand for information and perhaps the leverage points with these actors are somewhat different. So the interests of the private sector is fairly clearly focused on, uh, on supply sustainability and being able to source the correct amount and quality of the product they're looking for at a competitive cost. Now, if we look at the public sector, uh, the, the, the interests are slightly different. The interests there are, again, at least on paper, focused more on the provision of public goods and welfare for, for the, the members of the country, the farming communities and, and whatnot. So the interest there is slightly different. So here what we've tried to do is take the information we developed for, for the private sector and turn it into the cost of inaction maps to, raise, to clearly raise the issue for the public sector in terms of number of farming households impacted by climate, uh, and also the, uh, the cost to the uh, Ghanaian GDP from not acting on this kind of information. And again, the idea here is not necessarily to say that the public sector has to do everything or that the private sector has to do everything, but it's helping people understand that the threat that's being faced has implications for both public and private actors, and that there's a need to sit down to identify strategies that effectively can begin to bring together or bring to bear uh, blended resources between public funds and private funds to begin to make a difference in building a, re a more resilient system. So I think it's, it's more using this information to drive the establishment or the strengthening of partnerships between public and private rather than uh, a public discussion or a private discussion. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, another question that came in early from Albert that I think is um, best directed to Stephanie. Um, 
he he said Stephanie, as you recommend or as you recommended long-term funding of of a climate program, would you also agree with the idea that this long-term funded program should be a collaboration between governments and private companies? Thanks, Julie, and thanks, Albert, for the question. Um, I, I think the answer would definitely be yes. Obviously, there's lots of different kinds of adaptation programs being tried and being designed, but I think this question of um, uh, better alignment and uh, better putting together the pieces uh, in terms of the roles that the private sector can, can play, uh, the efficient distribution of inputs, uh, the better uh, access to market, providing stable um, and, and transparent buying relationships. These are areas that the private sector should be leading on, uh, but there are other things that without an active public sector role, uh, funding uh, better transition to other crops, the policies that help um, farmers get into other markets, uh, even some of the, the finance solutions to help subsidize some of the higher risk lending. These are things that uh, are better played by, roles better played by the government. So I think we would um, definitely back that idea and then we could get more into detail as we get specifics, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Great, thanks Stephanie. Um, and a bit of a clarifying question came in from Daniel Kangogo that I think uh, Lizzie will be able to answer. Um, which was, does it not make more sense to potentially dive further into resilience as opposed to adaptation? And perhaps clarifying what you mean by both of those. Great, and thank you, Daniel, for the question. Um, so just to, to put uh, some definitions out there so we're all more or less on the same page. Um, so I, when I think of resilience, I really like the definition of resilience as a capacity. So capacity to prevent or manage through shocks, and that can, in some cases, require adaptation, um, changing the status quo, or in some cases, it's more of a mitigating and coping scenario. Um, and so we certainly think that resilience is very important for smallholder farmers, for farmer enterprises, for supply chains, as we're confronting these issues of um, weather variability, changing temperatures, et cetera. And so the approach we, we've taken is kind of, if you, if you want to understand resilience, you need to answer the resilience um, to what, and so that's why we really focused um, in the early days of this project on understanding the risks, understanding the recommended adaptation practices for different value chains and geographies, and then working back from there to see, okay, if, if, if farmers and businesses need to invest in um, renovation or they need to invest in irrigation or maybe even diversification, how do you build that capacity of farmers to invest in that, of businesses to invest in that? And that's a little bit where we are now in the latter stage of the project is thinking about what that can look like at the different stages of the value chain. Um, and that's where the investment plans that Mark mentioned all the way at the beginning of the, the presentation would come in. So thank you for that question. Great, thanks, Lizzie. Um, and I'm actually, I'm going to toss a couple of questions out to Laurent. Um, and so Laurent, if you can, you can queue these up. Um, two questions. One Juan Rueda, who asked, can you share examples of the small packages created for farmers? I think this could be very valuable, as most of the time the private sector is trying to uh, gap as if farmers could afford it, if it was their priority. And then also a question from Stefan Jurka, which of the lessons and approaches are transferable to common smallholder crops, like maize and beans, et cetera, that aren't typically part of global supply chains? Oh. Okay, so two two questions. Okay, yeah, perfect. Um, so about the yeah, small packages. So um, the um, the way we did it is we took the so I'll I'll apply it on coffee. So um, we put the extension manual for Uganda, and so um, so of course you have weeding, you have pruning, you have all these different practices. And, um, and also fertilizer application, uh, applying manure and all of that. And so we, we went and interviewed experts in agronomy of coffee and we asked them, okay, can you uh, prioritize practices? You know, for example, we, we know that if, um, you know, a farmer should not put fertilizer on coffee if he's not pruning or if he's not weeding. So we asked um, experts to, to rank those practices. 
and then to make packages. So for example, the first package would be weeding the saccharine for, for coffee. So we know that if a farmer doesn't do that first, then he shouldn't even think about putting you know, pesticides or, or fertilizer. You know, he first need to do that. He first need to do pruning. So this is the type of, uh, of packages you have to think about. And of course, what we do in all these learning sites, we prioritize practices. For example, if you're in the east, uh, erosion can be a big problem. And you, I, I don't know if you know, if some people know Uganda, but you can have landslides problems. So there, of course, you know, understanding and, and doing erosion control is very important. If you if you're in the in the central learning site, for example, you have huge problems of twig borer, which is a pest on Robusta. So there you're going to prioritize uh, control of, of that pest. So there's a prioritization process that that goes on within um, those packages. So so you have in a way you have general packages that are based only on the good agricultural practices. But then you have based on where you are in the country, you're going to have a prioritization process. Uh, based on the on the site specific constraints, so so that's what we're doing uh, on stepwise, and 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 that's the type of small you know small packages that that you have to think of. Now about the smallholders and um, and the other crops, so um, and this again you know I, I applied on on the the African countries I'm working in, but for example in Uganda any any crop can become a cash crop as long as you have a market. So even if maize is a food crop and is, uh, you know, in the diet of a lot of farmers, if you have a market for it, uh, it will become a, a cash crop. And, um, and so what's more important then is, is to understand the balance between cash and food crops in, in a system. And it's actually quite funny um, because I was talking about that with Mark last week, but you know how it's true that if, you, if you're talking about value chains like coffee and cocoa, and that's the value chains that we work on, you know, do you have a formal value chain with formal traders? But what we see is that they only reach probably 20 to 30 percent of the, of the population. So even in, in, that, in, in such a sector, like a more formal sector, you have a whole informal um, market that, that's playing a role that we need to understand, you know, the link of, of farmers with, with that informal market. And then when you go into food crops, even, you know, food crops that became cash crops because of a market, you know, there again, you know, there's a lot of questions about, around informal market systems that we need to answer. So, um, so yes, you know, we definitely think about it. Yes, you know, some of the... Um, uh, some of the lessons can be um, uh, translated, but you know we, as depending on the crops. But the more you're getting in the food crops, you're gonna have to take into consideration that informal sector that we don't understand very well. Thanks. There you go. Okay, so I'm back on? Okay. So let me just answer again. I was trying to answer Anna Maria's question about the cross-learning. So yes, uh, the short answer is yes. We are working in about 10 countries on these topics, about uh, four in Latin America and six in Africa. And so we are in the process of, of pulling out sort of cross-learning across the different geographies. And we'll be publishing a, uh, a short overview paper towards the end of the year on this in a CCAF's book. So it would be great to share that with anyone who's interested. So yes, I mean, it's clearly important to identify what can we learn across commodity systems, across geographies, and across different contexts. Thanks for the question, Anna Maria. Uh, great. Thank really you, Mark. And thanks to all of the attendees for sticking with us through a bit of a, an audio snafu there. But we'll, we'll keep going with as many questions as we can get through uh, in the next 10 minutes or so. All right. Uh, a good question came in from Christina Manfrey, uh, who asked if we could speak to any examples where these partnerships have been successful in addressing the different needs of men and women farmers in responding to climate change. And so I'm going to pass this over. Uh, to Kurt to start, but then I think uh, Laurence, if you're still online, you might be interested in answering this one as well. Thank you. Maybe one thing. Uh, I, are you guys able to hear the audio? I'm counting to five. One, two, three, four, five. 
if the participants continue speaking, please type it in the chat box saying you can hear me. I uh, am trying to test the phone audio. That is back. Well, that's something. All right, let's go back to our original. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks right. for your patience. You on this. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry again for No, yeah, yeah, you should give him your headset. Um, hi, this is Kurt. We're still having some audio problems, but we're working through them. I wanted to just quickly address the, gen the gender differentiation question that came in from Christina. I just, uh, I think there are others, uh, including Laurence, who could address some of what's going on on the ground. But at the broad level, I wanted to mention that gender analysis, gender differentiation, and uh, targeting is very much a strong part of what we do across the Feed the Future initiative. Things like tailoring extension messages, paying particular attention to credit and loan needs, uh, doing uh, data analysis up front before we fund any project is, is fully and completely integrated uh, through our strong gender team in the Feed the Future initiative. So it's something that we do uh, thoughtfully and thoroughly throughout all of our programs. Uh, Laurence, I don't know if you are available to speak further to this uh, in terms of your work in Uganda. Yes, uh, sure. So, so maybe an example of, of what we're doing in, in Uganda. Of course, you know, if, if you're looking at, at coffee, it's a, it's a male-dominated um, crop. So, so it's everything that has to do with marketing, with having control over the money is, is uh, coming from coffee. It's very, it's, it's very often um, the men of the household to a point where when women need uh, money, they, uh, they take some of, the, um, some of that coffee to sell it on an informal market. But then, um, but then, you know, when you talk to the men, they say that, that their wives steal their coffee. So, so that's the type of story that we're getting on the ground. So um, there's a couple of things we can do about, um, you know, gender. There's that, that food versus uh, cash balance uh, that has a very big uh, gender impact. Uh, and, and let's say gen gender context um, that, and where you can work. Uh, we have also worked very um, nicely. Actually, it's the Hans Nerman Stiftung. They had a very nice uh, program on gender in Uganda, where they were uh, training couples on joint decision making. And we actually aligned with that program. We aligned um, a study on understanding the impact and that 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 joint decision making had on productivity of coffee and so on. And what we saw uh, was that we actually uh, there was um, you know a more adoption of intensification practices uh, in in households where men and women were deciding together as opposed to when when they made decisions separately or when the men made decisions alone. So um, so that's something that was very interesting. So we're working on it now. How that engagement actually with the private sector that. Not, not yet. You know, we talk about it. Uh, partners are are asking about it, about what they can do, especially you know the the groups in the in the in the you know with the private sector partners that are working on sustainability and 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 so on. But uh, the core business, I, I I haven't spoken yet, and and I haven't engaged with them on gender yet on the ground. But it's something that we need to follow up. But there's no clear. Um, interest at the moment. Great, thank you, Laurent. Aha, and we are back in action with our old audio, so <laughs> thanks all for your patience. Uh, great, okay, we have a question come in from Jerry Brown, which I will direct to Stephanie. The types of interventions along the value chain are impressive and uh, certainly a great improvement of how pr the private sector, local farmer support services, research, and farmer organizations work together. Question, 
how are the interventions along the value chains coordinated to allow the value chain participants to better receive the intervention? Uh, thanks, Julie, and thanks, Jerry, for that great question. So this is really at the heart of a lot of what we're trying to do, as well as what's happening in the Alliance for Resilient Coffee and the Climate Smart Cocoa work, is to find different ways of coordination and alignment to, to get information quickly to different actors. Um, and I just want to mention a couple different different ways. So at the beginning, for, for, for each country we're working in, we've um, uh, held stakeholder forums and participated in national platforms. There's a couple of countries that have very active national platforms that do bring together the private and public sector. Um, the Uganda coffee platform um, is an example of one. There are a number of them that are working to bring, to create a space where uh, different actors can look at similar data, like the, the, the crop suitability map, um, like some of the cost of inaction data, and that's a, I think those spaces at the national level are really critical. I would also say in individual value chains, having uh, information exchanged um, throughout between the, uh, the farmers, the, the direct service providers um, up and down the chain is still a challenge, particularly on what, um, what particular uh, challenges, the different kinds of weather impacts that different kinds of farmers are facing. So Laurent's talked a little bit about this. So how do you get in information from farmers and deliver analytics back to farmers having a feedback system? Um, so that still is really important. Um, I'd also say one last coordination vehicle we see at the global level is uh, for the private sector and public sector to work together. There are multi-stakeholder platforms. Um, we very quickly in this uh, initiative linked with a number of those, and I'll just mention one, being the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, created a roadmap to smallholder, to climate smart agriculture. One part of that is smallholder adaptation and resilience. Um, that's accessible online, we can share the links to that. But the, the, you know, that's a global coordination to try to leverage private sector resources and direct them to the areas of greatest need. Um, they chose, in, in coordination with us, Ghana as a road test country and are trying to get different companies that work in different sectors, the input sector, the basic grain sector, and, and of course in, in cocoa high value crops, to better coordinate. Um, so I think we need coordination at different levels, but uh, no question, it's, it's a critical piece of the puzzle. Thank you, Stephanie. I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions, and actually I think I'll shuffle two very quickly to Lizzie. One from Ana Maria uh, Lopez. Uh, Lobogero, if one of the main challenges is adoption because of lack of resources, could the private sector or the financial sector play a role in this, maybe through microcredits? And then if you also might just mention um, a question by Fernanda Lopez, if you could uh, say how we can find out a bit more about the co-op assessment tool that was mentioned. Great. Thank you. Um, this is Lizzie again from Root Capital. So, to answer Ana Maria's question, um, certainly we think that there is a role that the financial sector can play in supporting adaptation. Um, that's one of the reasons as part of the learning community and the associated initiatives, we've had this focus on identifying um, what are the adaptation practices, what might these investments look like, and what is the cost and, and benefit um, of those investments. And so um, for Root Capital, for example, as a lender, we would then be able to understand what types of investments might be financed by debt, which is something that we provide. Microfinance institutions would be able to take this information and do similar analysis um, based on, on their type of finance that they provide. And so that's certainly um, part of this work. I do want to um, just um, add a note that as we look at investments at the COPE versus the adaptation versus the diversification, risk gradient, um, we see that the risk and uncertainty increases um, with the, the risk of um, changing weather variability and other impacts. And so um, there will probably be some investments at the COPE level that will be um, able to be financed um, through kind of pure private sector debt finance or other instruments. But as we look at adaptation, as we look at diversification, that's again where we see more opportunity to look at um, blending private capital with public support um, or with grant support in other forms to help cover that risk and uncertainty 
um, rather than having farmers bear the cost of the increased risk and uncertainty. Um, so thank you, Ana Maria, for that question. And then on to Fernanda's question briefly. Um, so when we talk about the, the co-op um, assessment tool or the enterprise level assessment tool, essentially we're looking at two things. Um, one, a field assessment to understand what is the level of need um, in terms of adaptation at the farm level for that particular enterprise. And so that would be um, a fairly simple um, field survey that could be deployed paper or mobile using um, mobile tablets. And then we're also looking at a business level diagnostic that would be completed in partnership with the business management and looking at everything ranging from just the overall financial health of the business, um, how stable is that business, its management capacity to provide effective farmer services, namely extension and credit, and the technical alignment of those services to adaptation objectives for that particular crop and geography. So that's essentially what we're looking at, um, but again, it's very much in the works and we would obviously welcome input, feedback, thoughts. Um, so if that's a particular um, interest area for you, please contact us after the webinar. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Lizzie. Well, we are officially at our end time, and so I'm going to go ahead and unwrap the webinar. Uh, thank you so much to our excellent presenters for sharing your experiences. And uh, especially thank you to our participants. Um, you are the reason that we continue to hold these AgriLinks webinars, and we're so grateful uh, for your questions, your comments, the resources you shared, and just the fact that you continue to tune in. Uh, so thank you very much for your participation. Um, as I mentioned, we will send you the recording uh, in about a week's time, and we'll be sure to include any uh, additional suggested resources. And we're sorry we couldn't get to every question, but we will do our best um, to continue to follow up with those questions via AgriLinks. So thank you so much, uh, and we'll see you at future events. Signing off. <laughs>